Castro Cruel, baby. We're talking about inventory and cost of goods sold. And this is a tricky topic that the CPA exam loves to test. Now, we're going to talk about the Castro Cruel overview, how they compare to each other. We're going to talk about the journal entries that impact inventory, cost of goods sold. And then we're going to talk about the balance sheet approach and how we can use this method to simplify the Castro Cruel type of questions. And then we're also going to go through two example questions so that you master this topic. So let's just dive right into it. So when it comes to inventory and cost of goods sold, there is a difference when we're talking about cash versus accrual. So on the cash basis, cost of goods sold, well, that would be based on when materials are purchased, right? That's when the cash outflow occurs. When we purchase materials, we send the cash, that's when cost of goods sold is recognized in the cash basis financial statements. Now on accrual basis, we have to align the cost of goods sold with our revenue, right? That's called the matching principle. So cost of goods sold would be recognized when the inventory is sold to our end customer. So that is the fundamental difference and let's make sure we understand why. So when we think about it, from when a company would purchase the raw materials all the way until they actually sell that finished good to a customer, well, for some companies that could be a week, but for other companies that could be six months. And if we recognized the cost of goods sold when we purchase those materials well, on an accrual basis, that wouldn't align with the revenue, right? So that is why under the accrual basis, we only recognize cost of goods sold when that inventory is sold, because again, that is the matching principle. So let's understand from a balance sheet approach what would increase or decrease inventory before we get into how to use the balance sheet approach for inventory. So what would increase inventory? Well, inventory is increased when we purchase materials from a third party, right? A vendor. And that could either be raw materials or finished goods. And then when it comes to actually what decreases inventory, well, inventory is decreased on the balance sheet when we actually sell the item and we recognize the cost of goods sold. So in summary, right? Purchasing raw materials that increases inventory, actually selling a product and recognizing cost of goods sold, that will decrease inventory. So while we're on that topic, let's quickly look at the journal entries associated to those two activities. So as you can see, when we purchase materials on credit, well, the journal entry would be a debit to inventory and a credit to accounts of payable, right? And then when the inventory is actually sold, just from the inventory and cost of goods sold perspective, well, we would debit cost of goods sold for a number, right? And then we would credit inventory because we're removing that item from inventory and we're recognizing the expense, which is the cost of goods sold, in the income statement. So now we can introduce the inventory roll forward, and this is how it's always gonna be set up, right? So we have beginning inventory, and then again, what increases inventory? Well, that's gonna be material purchases, and then that will give us our cost of goods available for sale. And then what we would do is subtract out cost of goods sold for the period, and that will give us ending inventory. Now, the question, they could give you any combination of information here, and you would always need enough information to solve for the missing variable, and that's what the exam loves to test. They'll say, okay, how much inventory was purchased or how much material purchases did the company have or what was their cost of goods sold for a period? So now we can focus on an actual example, right? Because this is where we really hammer home our understanding, and that's when we apply the topic. So this question says, Mountain Burgers had the following financial information during year one. What amount of cost of goods sold is recorded on an accrual basis for year one. So we're going from cash to accrual here. So we should look at the information, right? And it says beginning inventory was $500. So we'll plug that into our roll forward. And then it says that ending inventory was 250. So plug that into the roll forward. And then it gives us material purchases for 750. So we'll go ahead and plug that into our roll forward. And as you can see, that gives us cost of goods available for sale of 1,250. Now, if ending inventory is 250, well, the only number that gets us down to that is going to be cost of goods sold, and that's going to be a negative amount, right? Because we're pulling that inventory out to be recognized as a cost of goods sold because we sold it. So negative 1,000, that is going to be the cost of goods sold recorded on an accrual basis for year one, right? So that's how we use the balance sheet approach when we're talking about a cash to accrual question. Now let's flip this around because there's another way they could ask this, right? They could ask us for accrual to cash. So the beginning inventory, the ending inventory, those are the same. But in this case, they're giving us cost of goods sold. And in this time, it's 1500 
So as you can see now, we don't have material purchases. We don't have cost of goods available for sale, but we do have cost of goods sold and we still have ending inventory. But we can back into cost of goods available for sale that we would need based on that ending inventory and cost of goods sold number. So as you can see, if we just took 250 and then we subtracted negative 1500, that means cost of goods available for sale would need to be 1,750. So if cost of goods available for sale now is 1,750, our beginning inventory was 500, well then obviously we purchased materials of about 1,250 during the year, right? And that's exactly what the question's asking. It's saying how much material was purchased and now we know the answer. So the beautiful thing here, right, is that we didn't have to change around our balance sheet approach. The formula was the same and we should never move it around. All we need to do is assess the variables they give us, plug them in, and then solve for the missing variable. This method will always work on the exam and for any question like this.